did you bring me here? Why did you take me? Well, I had to take you. Because the first thing you'd be doing, you'd be scuddling around and yodling the news that you were actually seeing a giant. And then there would be a great rumple dumpus, wouldn't there? And all the human beings would be rummaging and whiffling for the giant what you saw and getting wildly excited and then they'd be locking me up in a cage. Hi folks, I'm Ignati Vishnevetsky. And I'm Alex Dowd. We're coming to you this week from the AV Club set. Welcome to Film Club. I feel like the BFG should be a slam dunk if you just look at its individual components. You know, you have Steven Spielberg reuniting with uh, Melissa Matheson, who wrote E.T., his sort of most beloved family film. As well as Mark Rylance, who recently won an Oscar for right. Bridge of Spies. Working again with Giannis Kaminsky, although he does that every time now. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and adapting uh, Roald Dahl, uh, the beloved uh, children's author. Um, and adapting one of his, I would say, one of his more popular creations, the BFG. But I don't think that these, the sensibilities of these two artists really match up too well. You pointed this out in your review, and I think many of our colleagues have as well, that it is an odd fit, that he needs someone with a, that a doll adaptation kind of needs someone with a slightly darker side, or maybe a more, you could say, an, an adult sense of irony right. for it to work. Which is Spielberg's why humor is always so corny. You know, these corny visual gags. Well, Wes Anderson, obviously, mm -hmm. is, is, you know, people think of the fantastic Mr. Mm -hmm. Fox, which is, I mean, still very Andersonian. Or Henry Selleck, mm -hmm. uh, James and the Giant Peach, which yep. I think for a lot of people is sort of the standard for, yep. for doll adaptations. And that's true here. Or hell, Nicholas Rogue. You know, the witches, mm -hmm. bringing oh, out yeah. that strain of dark horror that is often in Dahl's work as well. So yeah, you need someone where they're going to attach themselves to the darker, more adult side of it, or the maybe the more ironic side of it, mm -hmm. rather than the more childlike side of it. So what did you think of Mark Rylance in this film? He's sort of been um, motion captured, and they've, uh, you know, they, they've used that technology to more or less preserve his appearance, but it el elongate it in certain ways. He's a wonderful actor. Mm -hmm. He's going to be wonderful in any role. Yeah. I wasn't, you know, coming off of something like Bridge of Spies, which is a really fantastically subtle performance. And he's also very subtle here, even though mm -hmm. he's playing this huge figure who can leap a hundred feet and is hiding in alleyways and being thrown around by other giants, he really underplays it uh, when it comes to his actual interactions with the little girl. Sure. Yeah, for, for a motion capture performance, it's very understated. But you but, had to add that caveat, because yeah, I feel like, I feel like there are very few exceptions to this, but for the most part, when I'm being asked to care about the relationship between a person and a special effect, it's a really hard emotional thing to sell. Mm -hmm. And I don't, even Spielberg being the, the technical wizard that he is, I'm not sure he quite gets it across, you know? Mm -hmm. This is definitely lesser Spielberg. Mm -hmm. And to me, what's really confusing about it is the things that Spielberg, the, the real Spielbergisms in the film. Like there's a scene where the BFG and the little girl, Sophie, who he's taken from an orphanage into giant country. They travel to dream country mm -hmm. where, you know, and they go through their reflection in a pond and they're visiting this tree where dreams drop down like dew drops off the leaves and they're mm -hmm. catching them. It should be a very classically Spielbergian kind of moment of awe and wonder, mm -hmm. and yet I found it completely interminable. Why do you think that is? There's just, there's something, I'm not sure what it is, but there's something missing. The things that should be the kind of the classic Spielbergisms, they never completely click, mm -hmm. and yet, it's when it gets really, really strange, which is the last third. Once the Queen of England gets involved in the plot, yeah. this sort of this idea that this film is supposed to give you some kind of sense of, of, of wonder completely falls away. I think that's when it actually comes together. I mean, I, I agree with you that the passage at, there's a passage at Buckingham Palace where the BFG shows up there, and that passage is by far probably the most delightful passage in the entire film. I, I mean, it's where the whole plot just grinds to a halt. Yeah. I mean, what plot, though? Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, I grew up on the BFG and I love it, but watching the film re really underlined how much um, that thing is not a crackerjack narrative. You sort of pour over its wonders and you're being taken on this tour of giant country and of this, this sort of alternate world doll is set up. But as a narrative, it's pretty pokey. There's not a lot of incident in it. And that, that I think that makes it kind of a strange fit for Spielberg as well, whose movies can kind of be these 
these sort of locomotive forward moving objects, you know. You do, you do sort of feel like he's trying to make non events seem as eventful yeah. as possible, right? She's taken to the, the BFG's cave, and there's a very long sort of sequence just looking around the interior, basically. Yeah. And you but get it's this not that interesting of a, of a no, space no. either, you know? <laughs> and you get this over and over again where you have just this, this reveal of a room. Basically, yeah. and you just get a few minutes of of effects and of uh, you know the uh, of the giant moving around and picking things from shelves, and as a result, the film feels kind of artificially overlong. It's mm -hmm. almost like it's playing out in slow motion. The, but the thing is that Spielberg is so good at this stuff. He is sort of the go-to, the perfect example of this of this sort of classic special effects spectacle, mm -hmm. and how how you play it out. And he does it very well here. There just isn't that much to be, you know, to be kind of uh, awed by, right. perhaps. I think Spielberg sees in this, um, he sees the BFG as kind of a surrogate for him, for himself, you mm -hmm. know. He works in this lab, he takes dreams and mixes them together, and then he sends them out into the world, into, into kids' imaginations, you know. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a scene where, a pretty lovely moment when we see that, that process working, and I, I don't recall this being an element that's in the doll text, I think this is Spielberg's invention, but basically we see the dream visualized as a shadow play mm -hmm. on sort of the wall or the curtain behind one of these sleeping kids. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, I think Spielberg looks at the BFG and sees a filmmaker, you know, sees somebody whose job it is to enchant the world, you know, which I think fits into the, the, the whole sentimentality that he sees in this story. In Spielberg, I've always said that uh, he's one of the greats at, at integrating digital effects into physical environments. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked before about Jurassic Park and why that film works and why those special effects still work, and a big part of it is that so much of what we're seeing on screen is real and organic, you have these special effects that are augmenting that and they're existing within that. In the BFG, once you get to giant country, predominantly what we're looking at is is ones and zeros. You know, we have a single human figure sort of acting against all this digital fakery. And I don't I think something about his craft gets lost when I mean it's something that I see in, in Tintin as well, mm -hmm. when he's losing that physical anchor. Do you think it's because he doesn't have to sell like when the mm -hmm. effect is ninety five percent of the frame, he doesn't have to sell the effect, right? right? He doesn't have to introduce the effect that's already there. Right. You think that's, he can that's even, part I, Yeah, I think that's part of it. I think he, can, he does less with the camera. I think he does less with his staging because all of that, all of those effects sort of do the work for him, you know? And, and one of the reasons I think that you and I maybe prefer the Buckingham Palace passage to everything in Giant Country is that that reverses the ratio again. Mostly what we're seeing is a real physical space that he's filming with real actors and oversized yep. props. Yep, with this one digital figure in it, mm. you know? Um, and I think that ratio works a lot better for him and, and ignites his imagination more. Without breaking much at all from the book, it's a very, very faithful adaptation. This movie does severely tone down the, some of the more macabre elements of the book, you know? It, like any sort of discussion of these giants basically eating people is uh, has been left mostly to implication, which I understand, obviously, mm -hmm. and I think part of that is Disney Disney. They just, they the kidnap bill. the kids. We don't know where we the don't kids know what, what, what happens what, what happened? we don't they know. They just disappear. <laughs> yeah. They just take the kids, they talk about things, something is delicious, but they never say. <laughs> and there's a lot a of discussion of that in the book, and I think that's part of, I mean, I think Dahl has always appealed to some of the darker fascinations of kids. You know, actually in the way that Spielberg did with something like Temple of Doom, mm -hmm. which has always felt to me like, it, you know, if, if Raiders is like his total adolescent imagination, Temple of Doom is like, here's all the gross stuff that 10 year old boys like. Yeah, you know? and it, it does yeah, play yeah. into those kind of morbid, yeah, 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 just everything, everything from human sacrifice to eating to bugs. monkey brains to bugs. Yeah, it's yeah, everything yeah. that like, that, that kids become fascinated with that's gross. Yeah. And it's aside from the farting, and by the way, this is our second week with a movie with with powerful jets of flash yeah, that right. play a role. But on. aside from that, I mean, I feel like that that Spielberg didn't show up for work. Maybe mm -hmm. that was the Spielberg that needed to be here for this one, you know. <laughs>